the Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of The Brain is presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth and Jeep Eagle, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation. The human brain appeared on the Earth some five million years ago. It took just a few million more to fully mature, a mere blink on the geological timescale. Structurally, anatomically, the human brain hasn't changed much in about 200,000 years. It's the same brain used by the first Homo sapiens to walk the planet. But what has evolved is the mind, and it's this inner universe that has so mystified and beguiled us. The mind, together with the brain, forms the most complex system known to man. At the dawn of the 21st century, we are slowly crossing the borders of this last frontier, so that we may understand better who we are why we create, imagine, and invent. Why our fears haunt us, our thoughts liberate us. Where we prove our free will, our sense of self, and express our inner voice. New mind imaging techniques give researchers a tool for mapping the mind. Never before could we look this closely inside the living brain. The subject of this image is tapping his fingers. The colored area shows where the brain generates the commands for movement. Hello, I'm David Suzuki. I'm sitting by a machine that opens a window into the human brain. It's called a functional MRI. Using radio waves, the MRI can record chemical changes in the brain as it thinks and reacts and learns. Philosophers, theologians, and psychologists have always speculated about this unmapped frontier. But now, new explorers are actually traveling the uncharted territory of the mind. This quest by neuroscientists may reveal how the biomechanisms of the brain determine who we are and may show us there's a lot more going on in our heads than we know about. It's an exciting journey, but a little scary. As we learn more about what makes our brains tick, we may feel the mind has been reduced to nothing more than a list of biological ingredients. One of the more curious aspects of the brain is its ability to alter perception, to change the mind's view of reality. Amazingly, the brain can do this without much effort and through unusual means, such as this mushroom. The mushroom contains a hallucinogenic chemical called psilocin. In Mexico, there are shamans who consume these mushrooms. 
People who visit them believe the shamans can heal their physical and mental illnesses by affecting consciousness. During this spiritual or mystical experience, the two women are physically changing certain systems in their brains as they ingest the mushrooms. Within an hour, the two experience hallucinations in which they see brightly colored geometric patterns and strange spirits. Poet William Blake wrote in 1793, if the doors of perception were cleansed, the world would appear to man as it is, infinite. As we learn more about how the brain works, we learn too that the keys to these doors of perception are the brain's own chemicals. The brain is a giant chemical factory concocting molecules at different sites. These chemicals have done much to explain human behavior, personality, and perception. They live inside the brain cells, the neurons, whose branches connect and communicate with other cells. The chemicals are stored in sacs located at the end of a neural branch, the site of the synapse, the space where one neuron sends its message to the next. An electrical charge frees the chemical molecules from their holding tanks, and they make their way across the synapse to the connecting neuron. Neurons chatter constantly in their unique language of electricity and chemistry. There are a hundred billion of them in the brain, and they form thousands upon thousands of communication lines with other neurons. Neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication serves as the basis of all brain activity. It's a simple mechanism that, when multiplied trillions of times, becomes astonishingly complex. When a neuron fires off an electrical impulse, it travels down a fiber called the axon until it reaches the end of its line, where the chemical molecules are stored. The electrical blast starts the chemical transmissions. The molecules that cross the synapse bombard the receiving neuron, which has special receptors set up to bind with them, like a lock and key. The molecules that travel from one neuron to the next are called neurotransmitters. So far, we've identified about 50 of them in the brain. Substance P, noradrenaline, endorphins, dopamine. There could be many more. What researchers are finding out is that neurotransmitters modify and even shape human behavior. A few in particular are helping scientists understand the biological basis of sadness and joy, love and violence, and the way we see the world through a particular human spectrum. One of these is called serotonin. Serotonin is the brain's workhorse. It has different roles in different places throughout the brain. Among other things, it controls mood, appetite, memory, and learning.
The hallucinations experienced by the shaman come by way of tampering with the serotonin system. Serotonin is unusual in that it can act as both an inhibitor and an enhancer, depending on where it is in the brain. In the case of hallucinations, serotonin acts in at least two important areas. In this PET scan image, these two areas are highlighted in red, the frontal lobes and the thalamus. The thalamus is the gateway of all sensory information. Everything we see, hear and touch arrives here before moving on to other areas of the brain. In a sense, the thalamus is like a valve controlling the flow of sensory information through the brain. Filtered information from the thalamus eventually travels to areas of the cortex for final processing. Much of that information makes its way to the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are the brain's smart parts. They use the incoming information to make decisions, to plan. Serotonin can influence how the frontal lobes make these decisions by either helping or hindering the thalamus. Psychoactive drugs do the same thing. The psilocin in this mushroom is remarkably similar in molecular structure to serotonin. Inside the brain, the psilocin bonds well with the serotonin receptors. The red-colored psilocin takes serotonin's place at the receptor site, releasing the valve of the thalamus. The result, too many electrical signals reaching too many parts of the brain. It's thought that this information overflow, especially in the frontal lobes in the thalamus, eventually distorts sensory perceptions and creates hallucinations. As far back as history allows, we've known of our ancestors' efforts to open the doors of perception through various means, including religious rites, hallucinogens, and sensory deprivation. In Japan, on a chilly winter day, four city dwellers make the trek up a mountain where they will endure seven days of sensory deprivation and fasting. The four include a boutique owner, a bus driver, a housewife, and a businessman. Japanese pilgrims have flocked to this site for more than a thousand years. This is Mount Kubote. Feeling a void in their everyday lives, people come here in search of a transcendent experience, one that would change their view of the world. During their fast, the four expect to experience hallucinations, which they believe carry profound messages. The pilgrims take turns leaving the group to spend two hours alone, chanting sutras. They have selected the coldest time of the year, a time when the mountain is deserted and the nights grow pitch black. The temperature is close to zero.
On the third frigid night, without food, and after long stretches of solitary confinement, the situation changes. A few begin to have vivid hallucinations. What is going on inside their brains? Again, the serotonin system is probably being affected, at least temporarily. When the serotonin levels in the thalamus are somehow shifted, the thalamus loses some of its ability to control the flow of information coming in from the senses. It's now day four of the fast. The hallucinations grow in intensity. Later, this woman reported that her hands moved of their own accord, as if someone else controlled them. Another person felt a presence on his left. At the moment, Setsukichi seems to be whispering to someone. He reported that at this point, a pilgrim from the past with a sword wound on his face, appeared and pushed him over backwards. <laughs> Blood samples taken from the group before and during the pilgrimage may provide insight about changes occurring inside the brain. Back at Japan's Hiroshima University, researchers process the blood. On the surface of the blood cells are receptors for serotonin. Tests show there were twice as many receptors present immediately following the hallucination. The scientists think the same thing might be happening in the brain. It's suggested that the pilgrims manage, through sensory deprivation, to increase serotonin activity in their brains and interrupt the inhibitory circuit of the thalamus. Tampering with the serotonin system is, in a sense, like loosening our biological brakes. It can sometimes permanently change one's perspective. Artists, by their very nature, look on the world in alternative ways. Alex Gray became familiar with the human body while taking anatomy courses at Harvard. As a young man, the artist also familiarized himself with LSD. Like psilocin, LSD resembles serotonin in structure and bonds with serotonin receptors in the brain. For Alex, affecting the mind this way allowed him to move beyond his ordinary perspectives in unpredictable ways. And you can never exactly tell what's going to come, uh, especially if you do something like psychedelics, you know. There's an uncontrolled element 
about it, an uh, element of surprise uh, of what the unconscious is capable of releasing. Much of his art shows recurring images, meant to convey the extraordinary interconnectedness humans have with the world. Alex physically, deliberately manipulated his brain. His visions come by way of simply altering one of its chemical systems, but the effects are profound and sobering. Frightening for some, enlightening for others. Is that uh, the psychedelics could be a great tool uh, for the visionary artist? At least they have been for me. It's like a uh, telescope or a magnifying glass into hidden dimensions of the. Uh, of consciousness, transpersonal dimensions of consciousness or sort of uh, hidden, unconscious, ugly, surreal, weird uh, kinds of dimensions. Uh, a person can go mad, in a sense, uh, for a few hours and uh, come back. In addition to serotonin, there's another major neurotransmitter called dopamine that regulates activity in our brains. Like serotonin, dopamine acts as an inhibitor, dampening activity so that we are not overwhelmed, so that we stay firmly rooted to the world we know. Like all neurotransmitters, dopamine travels along special pathways in the brain. These pathways extend into different areas where dopamine plays different roles. For example, researchers have mapped several dopamine projections into the basal ganglia, the area highlighted in red and yellow. The basal ganglia are located in the brain's interior. And studies on the basal ganglia show that they're an area critical for executing smooth and controlled movements. When dopamine fails to reach this area, Parkinson's disease sets in. People with the disease lose their ability to initiate and control movement. Dopamine also flows into the frontal lobes, where, like serotonin, it regulates the flow of information coming in from other places in the brain. Some researchers hypothesize that a compromise in the flow of dopamine, especially in the frontal lobes, may produce disruptive or incoherent thought. The dopamine pathways may offer insight into one of the most baffling mental illnesses ever to confront scientists, schizophrenia. I don't want to live anymore because the mental process of the mind takes over. When I think I'm doing good for a while, something mental takes over and it scares me. Schizophrenia strikes without warning, usually during late adolescence. The disease shatters personality, replacing it with delusional thinking and jumbled speech. Schizophrenia steals a person's ability to think straight and leaves them with only the most tenuous hold on reality. For doctors, the causes of schizophrenia are still a mystery, but most consider the dopamine system to be involved in some way. Those people at 7-Eleven, they're always on the phone talking about me. Always, especially in the summertime, nice weather. Researchers can now point out some of the biological differences in the brains of patients who have schizophrenia 
using imaging machines like this PET scan. The brain of a healthy individual is scanned for comparison. PET scans measure levels of brain activity, which appear as different colors. This is the brain image of a person suffering from schizophrenia. It shows decreased blood flow in the frontal lobes, the site of critical dopamine pathways. The frontal lobes are where reasoning and higher ordered thinking take place. Notice the dramatic difference of frontal lobe activity in a healthy brain. Doctors aren't sure yet what the exact relationship is between frontal lobe activity, dopamine levels, and schizophrenia. They do know the dopamine system plays a significant role, not only in mental illness, but in milder disorders as well. Too much dopamine in the limbic system and not enough in the cortex may produce an overly suspicious personality, given to bouts of paranoia, or it may inhibit social interactions. A shortage of dopamine in the frontal lobes may contribute to poor working memory, that is, the ability to hold something in the mind for several seconds at a time, such as adding several numbers together in your head. Dopamine is also thought to produce feelings of bliss. It's sometimes referred to as the pleasure chemical. One theory even suggests that dopamine helps regulate feelings of pain in the body. When an injury occurs, several receptors in the skin become activated. When stimulated, they then produce an electrical signal that travels through the spinal cord and eventually reaches the brain. The brain evaluates the pain and responds accordingly, sometimes by releasing its own natural made painkillers called endorphins. Endorphins bind at special opiate receptor sites of neurons where they begin the process of mediating pain. Researchers now think that endorphins may affect the dopamine pathway that feeds into the frontal lobe. This is where that pathway begins. The activity of this pathway is usually held in check by other neurons, shown in blue. They inhibit the flow of dopamine. In turn, the blue nerves are connected to these purple nerves that release endorphins. When vast quantities of endorphins are released, the blue nerves shut off, so to speak. The end result? Much more dopamine flows through the pathway. And that means more dopamine is secreted in the frontal lobe, replacing pain with pleasure. It's one theory that explains the high that often accompanies grueling endurance sports. Among its many roles, dopamine plays a part in perhaps the greatest of human dramas, love. This is Rio de Janeiro, a logical place to go looking for love, or rather, its biochemical basis. This carnival queen reports that she's been swept off her feet. Blame it on Rio, or the brain. Let's try the latter. Now most of us know the strange and exciting feeling of love, but the brain chemicals that produce this kind of reaction are not as well known. Love, in fact, is a drug, a couple of them. One is dopamine. When we fall in love, a surge of dopamine rushes through the brain. It's dopamine that makes us feel good about the world, that makes us smile at strangers. Another chemical, noradrenaline, is involved too. 
As streams of noradrenaline flow through the brain, they stimulate the production of adrenaline in the body. This accounts for the familiar racing heart, the sweaty palms and flushed cheeks that accompany new love. Add one more chemical to the mix, phenylethylamine, which is also a natural ingredient in chocolate. And soon, we're in a state of bliss. Together, these chemicals create a love potion so powerful they sometimes override brain activity that governs logic. And sometimes take us right over the edge. But why? Well, one explanation is that these chemicals play a critical role in the limbic system, the seat of emotions. There's a shift in the balance of brain power. The limbic system takes over in a sense. There's less integration with the more thoughtful cortex. That's why we sometimes choose someone who's all wrong for us. But this chemical flood eventually dries up. The surges end. What happens then? Love moves into the cortex, the thinking part of the brain. It's here that we get hold of ourselves and either experience true love or wonder what we ever saw in him or her. Brain chemicals still play a role in true love, but these are the chemicals of attachment rather than infatuation. They produce successful marriages. And they're also associated with the love that families share, that creates kinship. As it happens, the chemical dopamine plays a role in both infatuation and true love. Because dopamine stimulates the production of another true love chemical called oxytocin. Here, the oxytocin neurons in the middle of the screen are surrounded by nerve fibers along which the dopamine flows. The release of dopamine from these fibers stimulates the secretion of oxytocin, represented in green. Oxytocin is the glue that bonds us, that keeps us monogamous, that maintains family bonds. It also strengthens the bonds between mother and child. Oxytocin is called the cuddle chemical, and for a reason. It's present in high levels in women who've just given birth and increases a mother's urge to cuddle or nuzzle her infant. Oxytocin's effects were dramatically shown in recent experiments at the University of Maryland. These are prairie voles, rodents that live in family units. The breeding pair is strictly monogamous. Prairie voles mate for life. On the other hand, their cousins, the montane voles, play the field. They are quite promiscuous critters. Commitment means nothing to them. Although these two species look the same, their brains differ in one significant way. The areas in green contain receptors for oxytocin. The green oxytocin receptors of the family-oriented vole are shown on the left. On the right, the less committed vole just can't compete. Distinct differences become apparent in the behavior of the two species when newly born young are separated from their mothers. The montane vole, with few oxytocin receptors, is indifferent to her young. Nor do the babies feel a very strong attachment to their mother. Then, the prairie vole is taken away from her young. 
Already, the bond is obvious. When placed back in the cage, the prairie vole quickly runs to her young to cover and protect them. They cling to her just as fiercely. Of course, all this talk of oxytocin and dopamine doesn't sound very romantic. Some might argue to leave love well enough alone out of the hands of science. But leading neuroscientists, including Antonio Damasio, assure us there's nothing wrong with searching for love in the brain. Dr. Damasio has dedicated his career to mapping aspects of the mind using the latest brain imaging techniques at the University of Iowa. About certain substances like, for instance, oxytocin, and how they are related to behaviors uh, that have to do, for instance, with attachment among individuals. Uh, how they are related, in fact, to many things that are components of uh, phenomena such as the phenomena of love. Does that make you love less? Does that make you less respectful for love? I don't see any reason why it should. You can, you can understand that, the same way that understanding, for instance, how you digest a great big steak uh, does not take away the, the fact that you may still want to have a stake one, once in your life. Dr. Damasio's studies have made him a principal theorist of perception and most recently moral reasoning. He believes that translating powerful human experiences into brain activity doesn't diminish their authenticity. No. Uh, a number of neurochemical transmitters and neuromodulators that are going to make you cry or that, or that are going to make you smile within a certain context of your life, that doesn't mean that I should have any less respect for your sadness or for your happiness. It has to, it's something that occurs in parallel. It is one thing to know the mechanisms that lead in part to your sadness and to your joy and another to have respect uh, and to have sympathy and empathy with that joy and with that sadness. Perfectly compatible. In fact, one of the things that I like to tell people uh, with whom I speak about this subject is that even after knowing everything we know about what generates human emotion, you would still be authorized, authorized to have an entirely romantic view of the value of emotions for human beings. The case of 19-year-old Natalie provides another viewpoint from which to observe emotion and behavior. Natalie's MRI image shows that she's missing a part of the brain called the amygdala that mediates emotion. Normally, it would fill in the darkened area. Without an amygdala, Natalie experiences uncontrolled levels of anxiety and anger. This film was taken at a hospital when Natalie was 10. Hey, 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 calm down. Here with her parents, Natalie was suddenly terrified by her own reflection in a mirror. Even now, her condition remains unchanged. The video crew makes her extremely anxious. Whenever strangers visit the house, Natalie locks herself in her room. Anxiety and fear are primitive instincts originating in the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus 
can generate either pleasure or anxiety in response to external stimuli. The amygdala controls those emotions. Without it, they would go unchecked. Well, we all have a primitive fear of strangers. We're all wary around strangers. That's wired into us. It's probably wired in at the level of the hypothalamus. Um, she, those kinds of responses in her are unconstrained or are unconstrained unless you use this strategy of teaching habits to shape them. So what you get in her is the raw response that's wired in all of us, uh, but uncontrolled, unconstrained, unmodulated. There are people, however, who have a calming effect on Natalie and with whom she enjoys a close relationship. Patty. That's right. Natalie has grown attached to her tutor, for example. She is also extremely close with her mother. The comforting environment provided by her mother makes her feel at ease. If chemicals in the brain can change behavior, does that mean they also dictate a person's character and temperament? What are the processes up here that produce an angry young man, for instance, that can land someone in a jail like this, and not just once, but repeatedly? Some now argue that the roots of violence and aggression can be traced both to an individual's path in life and his brain chemistry. Early experience can change the brain's chemistry for life. What we go through when we're very young creates a permanent template for mood and personality. For example, too much stress in children can lead to permanently low levels of serotonin and high levels of noradrenaline, a combination associated with aggression. The result, a molecule cocktail waiting to explode. At the Medical College of Pennsylvania, a program is underway to treat the biological roots of aggression. Psychiatrist Emil Kokaro heads the program. Dr. Kokaro has focused his career on researching the causes of violent behavior. Well, people think of behavior largely as being something that's determined by how one grows up, you know, how their parents treat them, things that happen to them in life. And that's certainly a very important part of behavior, that sort of developmental kind of thing. But the fact is that we are biological organisms and our brain is a biological organ and it works through sending chemical messages back and forth between various neurons. Okay. Dr. Kokaro <laughs> has found a remarkable correlation between low levels of serotonin and aggression. He's had some success treating patients with fluoxetine, commonly called Prozac, which increases serotonin activity in the brain. Serotonin usually acts as an inhibitor on other neurons. So it tends to act as a breaking mechanism for other systems in the brain. So if you are in your environment and something, and you are stimulated by something, somebody says something nasty to you or somebody's trying to do something to you, someone's provoking you in some way, then the norepinephrine system and the dopamine system are called into action 
and they stimulate behavior. If the serotonin system is low, in addition to that, then the likelihood that you are going to use aggressive behavior is much greater because the brakes are low. Dr. Kokaro's patients cover a wide range. Some are physically violent. Others, such as Larry Mitchell, are unable to control their verbal rages. Mr. Mitchell's long history of having a short fuse was getting him into trouble, personally and professionally. He came to the clinic looking for a way to control his behavior. Well, I, I think the, the one that really was the straw that broke the camel's back was in Philadelphia. I uh, was out at a traffic light and someone pulled out right through a red light and there I was with my steering wheel hollering at him, you ever, and saying every word I could possibly think of. And uh, you know, I was caught myself and then I heard on the radio this advertisement uh, about uh, a training program. And I frankly parked the car right there and went over to the phone and called the number. On the surface, Mr. Mitchell seemed a great success, an environmental engineer with his own thriving business. But inside, something wasn't working right, and it threatened to shatter the relationships he had carefully cultivated over the years. In fact, I know I lost a customer one time. Uh, they did something wrong, and I just got carried away and started verbally hollering. <laughs> I was irritated. Uh, and it lost me a, a project. So yes, there are some consequences. The main thing is the, uh, the loss of the, uh, the love of the children and family. That was the one that had the greatest impact on me. Within just a few weeks of taking Prozac, Mr. Mitchell's impulsive and angry outburst stopped. He began to repair his damaged relationships. My kids kind of look at me and saying, why am I not so grumpy? <laughs> and it's kind of a joke uh, because uh, we're just, we've gone through a much greater bonding. Uh, it's, I know it's great for me and I, I enjoy being with them and I know they enjoy being with me and my wife sees a, a big shift in my attitude, uh, not being always so grumpy or uh, irritated. Um, people at work, I think, were the first people to notice. Um, I had a secretary who just couldn't figure what was going on, why I was so peaceful. Um, and she remarked, I don't know what you're doing, but continue doing it. <laughs> Prozac, originally marketed as an antidepressant, today is being targeted for a variety of mood disorders, including aggression. Prozac doesn't change personality, so much as it modifies well, behavior. We're correcting an imbalance that's been there for so long. People who are um, aggressive, for example, who we give this, who we give fluoxetine to, who become less aggressive, their personality hasn't really been changed. Uh, we've treated their tendency to be aggressive. We suppress their ability to respond aggressively. That doesn't mean they can't. If you provoke them enough, they will still uh, respond. But the things that used to get them hot under the collar or angry before, just don't get them angry anymore. I'm still the same me. Uh, I, as I might think of myself, the only thing that's occurring is a slowdown in reaction time. I still get angry, but there's a big difference in how I'm showing up uh, to that anger and reacting to the anger. I found out there's a delay now, uh, and I can actually uh, choose how I want to react as opposed to allowing the incident to carry my reaction on. Prozac is not the panacea for the 21st century, and its use is still hotly debated. Dr. Kakaro stresses that the drug's applications are limited and highly dependent on the individual patient. Uh, the thing that I have to that I always tell people is that um, aggression is multi-determined. There are a number of things that go into it, and there's more than enough room for uh, psychobiologists and sociologists and psychologists uh, in treating this problem. Certainly, if there are overwhelming social conditions that are horrible, that are going to make life very difficult to people, that's going to make it very hard for medications to do much. Uh, it might help a little bit.
but you need to attack the problem from, from multiple directions. A hundred years ago, the walls of this laboratory were lined with preserved brains, pickled in fact. They were the brains of patients in what we used to call an insane asylum. Pathologists hoped those brains would reveal the secrets of the human condition. They didn't. Today it's a different story. We're discovering that human behavior is deeply rooted in biology. More and more, we can explain the things we do by the chemicals swimming around in our heads. We can even create pills that mimic them. Dr. Kokaro's work in Philadelphia suggests we've found a prescription for successful intervention, a way to treat societal ills when other methods don't work. But the implications of a chemically improved society are still frightening. For one thing, what do we mean by improved? And the very idea of a biochemical basis for personality challenges our historic view of ourselves. In the past, the law itself has excused us from accountability if our actions resulted from some biological flaw beyond our control. But what now, when we can correct these flaws with chemicals? So, what's the verdict? How should we feel about this? What does this scientific evidence say about who we really are? At the turn of the millennium, as the old world of mystery and myth gives way to the age of scientific reason, the jury is most definitely still out. For the Discovery Channel, I'm David Suzuki. Discovery Channel and the Chrysler Corporation are proud to bring you the best in quality documentary television. This presentation of The Brain is presented in partnership with Chrysler Plymouth and Jeep Eagle, divisions of the Chrysler Corporation.